This is the last time series lecture on non-stationarity or trends. So trends. If the data is in fact non-stationary, the last lecture was about stationarity. Stationarity meant that the, uh, the distribution of the variables in the model and the error term had to be the same over time. If, this is, if they're non-stationary, then traditional confidence tests and forecasts will not be valid. So we have to talk about when something is non-stationary. The definition of a trend, a persistent long-term movement of a variable over time. So log GDP or just GDP has a clear upward trend. If we were to plot it, it would look something like this. Right, so there's an upward trend. A trend does not need to be present or the same for all time periods of the data. What we want to do is, in, we we want to capture um, because this relationship is kind of spurious we know that this thing is trending upwards uh, but if we're going to do short-term predictions we need to uh, eliminate that trend we got to figure out what's actually causing that the, the values of GDP to change from one year to the next <clears throat> a non-random function over time. For example, log GDP rises at the rate of 0.75 t on average where t is the time period, which is random. Stochastic just means random. It's a random trend that varies over time. Commodity price and stock prices tend to exhibit random trends. Unemployment's do it. Econometricians consider trends to be stochastic even if they look deterministic. Just to assume they're stochastic. It's a uh, by controlling for time in the model, um, a linear function of time, for example. Uh, but a stochastic trend is a little more difficult to control for. A time series is said to follow a random walk if the change in yt is iid. So here's an example of a stochastic trend, a random walk. So the, the random walk is just defined by yt equals its past value plus some random error term ut, where ut is iid and the expected value of that error term is equal to zero, conditional on all the past values. And this says that the value of the time series is the value yesterday plus some random component. Interestingly, because we assume the expected value of the error term is zero, uh, the conditional mean of yt so if we take the, the expected value of this function here, conditional on everything on the right-hand side, that's what we're doing here, that's equal to yt minus 1 plus ut, which if we take the expected value of ut, conditional on stuff, that's equal to 0, then that bit drops out and we're just left with yt minus 1. In other words, the best predictor of today's value is yesterday's value. So if you were going to bet on a stock price today, what the best predictor is the stock price yesterday. A random walk with a drift. So some series like GDP have an upward tendency and beta zero. So if we expand on the random walk model from the previous slide, we can add this intercept term, which is just the drift. If it's positive, it means that this random walk is trending upwards. If it's negative, it means the random walk is trending downwards. Notice we don't have a beta here. We don't have a beta hat one. And uh, this is essentially saying that we're, impl or we're imposing the restriction that beta hat one is equal to one. Uh, and this will be used for a test of a random walk later. A random walk is non-stationary. The variance of the random walk increases over time, so the distribution of yt changes over time. Remember, stationarity required that the distribution of the yt did not change over time. And we'll, we'll show you in just a second that the variance changes over time if there's a random walk. So example, one way to write this is that since ut is uncorrelated with yt, we can write, or we can take the variance of the, um, so remember, what's our random walk equation? Let me just write that down again. Oops. Did it again. Okay. Since 
ut is uncorrelated with yt, we can write the variance of yt is equal to the variance of yt minus 1 plus the variance of ut. Um, so we can distribute the variance through a random walk equation. Uh, and for yt to be stationary, the variance of yt cannot depend on time. So the, the variance of yt equals the variance of yt minus 1. In other words, the variance we're deal we want for stationarity, we want the distribution of yt to be constant. And if it's not, then we're left with um, a, a non-stationary uh, variable. But that can only happen if the variance of ut is equal to zero, which would violate the assumption of the random walk. Um, so if we're dealing with a situation with a random walk, the variance of ut is non-zero, and we're left with a, a non-stationary uh, variable. Let's think about this. Uh, so if y zero, so if we have t and y, t of zero, one, two, three, etc. We're saying the first period y is equal to zero, second um, uh, t equals one, y equals two, etc. We can put whatever we want there. But the important thing is that y zero is equal to zero. Then according to our a uh, random walk equation up here when y t minus 1 or y 0 is equal to uh, to 0 then we're just left with uh, the error term so that y 1 is equal to u 1 the error continuing on this trend y 2 is equal to uh, the error first error plus the second error it's and ultimately we end up with y t equals the sum of all the error terms and the variance of yt is equal to the variance of all those error terms. And since ut are serially uncorrelated, then the variance of yt equals t times the variance of ut. So the variance increases linearly with t. So we just showed that when we have a random walk, the variance of the random variable y, it depends on t. And that violates the assumption of stationarity because the variance is a component of the distribution of that random variable. And if the distribution is changing over time, then it's non-stationary. Okay, stochastic trends, autoregressive models, and the unit root. Um, so, the random walk is a special case of an AR1 model, an autoregressive model with one uh, lag. The model in which a model in which beta one is equal to one. So, if beta one is equal to one in an AR1 model then yt contains a stochastic trend it is non-stationary. If, on the other hand, beta 1 is less than 1, or the absolute value of beta 1 is less than 1, and ut is stationary, then the joint distribution of all the yt does not depend on t, so yt is stationary. So we're going to come up with a test to see whether or not beta 1 is equal to 1 or is less than 1. There's an analogous condition for an ARP model, or a model with p lags, which involves the roots of a polynomial, polynomial in terms of the lags. In particular, the roots must be greater than 1, which is equivalent to the, the absolute value of the beta being less than 1. If an ARP model has a root that equals 1, the series says, is said to have a unit root, which means it contains a stochastic trend and is non-stationary. So a stochastic trend and a unit root are the same they mean the same thing, and they imply non-stationary. That's something we have to deal with. Problems caused by stochastic trends. So problem one, the co coefficients will be biased. We're violating assumptions of our model. Uh, we're violating, in particular, the stationarity assumption. And if we do that, then the coefficients, of course, are going to be biased, and in this case, biased towards zero. But if it will be biased towards zero if the unit root is ignored because the OLS assumption for the time series models are not valid. Problem two, the t-stats on the coefficients will have non-normal distributions, which means we can't use normal inference when we are evaluating our t-statistic or our coefficients. And also, the two, if we're evaluating two time series like I've drawn here, maybe this is y and this is x and this is time, and this is time. They're both trending upwards. If we correlate them with one another, then we're getting most likely spur spurious correlation. So detecting stochastic trends, um, we can do it informally by computing autocorrelations. If the autocorrelation is small and the time series plot has no apparent trend, then it's unlikely 
to but of course we have a uh, a more formal method because we're in an it's called the Dickey Fuller test just erasing had to re-record this so um, so as mentioned above if beta 1 and AR1 model is equal to 1 then why stochastic trend then this leads us to the obvious hypothesis that um, in a um, in a model that looks like this with yt equal to um, or an AR1 model our null hypothesis is that beta 1 is equal to 1 versus the alternative that beta 1 is less than 1. If beta 1 is equal to 1, the AR1 model has an autoregressive unit root of 1. So the null is you have a unit root and the alternative is you don't, stationarity. So if you reject the null, uh, then you're in a good stationary world. If you fail to reject the, the, the null, then you're in a non-stationary world. This can easily easily be implemented by subtracting yt minus 1 from both sides of that AR1 equation. So if we do that, we get the difference in yt as a function of uh, subtracting yt minus 1 again over here. And then we're left with uh, delta yt equals beta 0 plus beta 1 minus 1 yt minus 1 plus ut. Uh, and the Dickey Fuller test can uh, tell, if us, tell us if we have a stochastic trend by uh, seeing if beta 1 minus 1 in this model is equal to 0. Um, so we can remove a stochastic trend, or how to address a unit root or stochastic trend. We can remove a stochastic trend by estimating the model in first differences. What are first differences? It's just subtracting the, the lag uh, from both sides. If yt follows a sto stochastic trend, um, so that or a random walk, so that it looks like um, this bit here, where beta zero is the drift and ut is the random component, then we can subtract the first lag and get the difference in yt. That's the first difference right here, and we can subtract it from both sides, and we get. Let me write this. We get delta yt, um, or the first difference of yt is equal to beta 0 plus ut. We know beta 0 is stationary because it's just a constant, and then by assumption ut is stationary, so we've shown that the first difference of yt is stationary. Um, to address this in a model, we would just uh, take the first differences of both sides. So how do we do that? In practice, we take our model, yt, uh, that changes every color, yt equals beta 0 plus beta 1 yt minus 1. I'm talking about this model here. We'll, we'll subtract off yt minus 1 from this side. And then in this case, we're going to subtract off uh, from, since we're dealing with yt minus 1 over here, we're going to subtract off yt minus 2. So this is the first difference for yt, and this is the first difference for yt minus 1. That's in practice how you do first differences. So that's essentially what we have for time series. The book has plenty more on this topic, but that's an introduction to probably the most important parts of time series. Um, you're, you've been introduced to autoregressive models. You've been introduced to stationarity and uh, stochastic trends. Um, and so that should get you started. These are useful for prediction and all sorts of things.